So Elon Musk has clearly stated that the humanoid robot will be the biggest of all companies or divisions. Optimus will be number one among many great companies. Well, now that's saying a lot because a lot of smart people are predicting that RoboTaxi, Starlink, energy storage, and the BEVs, just the cars and trucks themselves, will all be larger in revenue than Walmart and, and bigger in profits than Apple. Others add Neuralink and the boring company to that list. Twitter could end up dwarfing Facebook if it gets into financial transactions. This is Randy Kirk. Today, I'm going to be talking to you all about Optimus. I'm going to try to bring together all the interviews I've been doing over the last three or four weeks on Optimus, all the things we've learned into one location. So if you like this kind of content, please let me know. And please also subscribe and hit notify for fantastic programs that we've got coming up here this week. And then uh, obviously, I'd love to have you join my Patreon group. Uh, another several people over the weekend. So happy to have you guys on board and we need that we need that help in order to support make the channel work okay so let's get back into it here <clears throat> elon's bold statement is based on the idea that labor is the largest component of the economy there are currently about 3.5 billion people that are employed in the world now while part of the goal for optimus is to take over some of those jobs the especially the ones that are boring and repetitive and might be dangerous. Um, the reality is that the bot will create huge new industries that are currently not profitable due to the co high cost of labor. And the high cost of labor in some countries it may not seem that high, but let's take a look at how this works. Over the years, my companies have been known to uh, take on new ideas. We were very excited and still am actually to hear from inventors and others who have a great idea and just uh, help them figure out whether it is a great idea and then how to get it to market. And uh, so, so garage inventors and company owners and others who don't have the time or the knowledge or the capital to bring their good ideas to market, they would you know look me up and they'd hear about the fact that I would listen to their concepts and they'd send me their NDAs and then they explained their hopium to me. <laughs> In fact, just a week ago, I spent an hour on the phone with somebody who had a brand new concept that was a huge thing. I mean, if it works, it's going to be big. Anyway, some of the products uh, that look like they could be compelling and useful and the consumers would want to buy them in quantity. But then it turns out that there's a sticking point. The item might look like it would sell great at, say, $20. But then when you start adding up all the costs, they might look like it's going to cost $40 retail. And since most products are only made up of two components, materials and labor, the only way to overcome the problem of the $40 cost is to find ways to reduce the materials or the labor. Now, commonly, of course, there are serious limitations on limiting the material costs. You might be able to replace steel with plastic or you know uh, you might be able to lighten it up with aluminum so you're not using as much so there's lots of ways you might be able to get the material cost down but usually i found that the labor is the big killer and the labor cost comes down to the skill levels of the humans that you need to employ because more skilled people are going to require more dollars per hour and then also the number of uh, units of the efficiency. How many units can you get through the, uh, the, the process in how much time? Um, now, then there's the other place. The other thing is where are you going to make it? So if you can make it in Indonesia, you might be able to get your labor at four or five, six dollars an hour, where in the United States, you're pretty well today. It's going to be over 20 plus all the add ons to the point where your minimum is probably 25 to 30 dollars in actual money out the door for every hour that somebody's employed. If I can, now the first thing I might look at um, is should I ship it overseas? The second thing I might look, look at is can I automate it? Um, and then um, maybe I can do some of both. Maybe I can automate it and make it overseas. So, you know, maybe at this point you're saying, Randy, that's obvious, or maybe not. Maybe uh, you've never really had to think through how a product is costed out in order to determine whether it's going to be saleable or not. Now then, if you want to automate, you need volume. In fact, for most offshore production, you need to think about at least 5,000 units opening order. For automation, you're usually going to need 
way more than that before you can afford to automate. So then if you don't automate and you have to build these things with human hands, then you have a couple of choices. You can try to charge more and see if that'll work while you're still in low quantities. But of course, that's going to limit your quantities because the price is always going to be a limitation. Almost always. I could give you some exceptions. Um, and then your uh, the other choice is to lose money for a while or possibly both. That is until you can afford when you get enough volume to take it offshore and or to automate it. Well, OK, so these are some of the choices. And then sometimes there's no way to automate at all. There really just isn't any way to get that thing. I don't care how many units you're going to do or how much you're willing to pay for the automation. It just can't be automated. Well, that's where the humanoid robot becomes key. So Optimus will eventually have the, uh, the ability to do pretty much anything that a human can do on a factory floor. And I, when I say factory floor, I mean in a kitchen, uh, in you know, like a, an industrial kitchen or a McDonald's kitchen or um, you know, working in a uh, any situation where there's human labor involved. So that's kind of the ultimate goal. Now, a lot of people have said, well, I want to have one in my home. That's going to take a lot longer. I think you'll see that as we talk about the training in a couple of minutes, how you train a robot, how you train an Optimus robot, at least. Uh, it's going to be a while. I would say probably three or four years before there's going to be much that the, the robot will be able to do in your home. But the robot has a cost that is so much different than automation or human labor. You can either potentially lease it, so you're getting it by the hour. So let's say you lease it for $100,000 a year. But the robot can do four times the work of a human if it does it at the same rate. If it does it faster, obviously that's going to drop it. So if you're talking about spending $100,000 a year to lease a robot, you're really talking about a comparison of four to one. So you're paying $25,000 a year to get the robot and you eliminate all of the drama. You eliminate them going home in the middle of the day during a shift or even quitting in the middle of the day or at the end of the day, you eliminate training, you eliminate breaks, you eliminate so many other possibilities. Uh, and then um, the Optimus robot undoubtedly will be way, way more uh, 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 what do you want to call it? They're not going to make as many mistakes. All right. So now you've got the price in the United States down to somewhere in the ballpark of the lowest possible labor that you're going to be able to hire. And of course, right now we have a labor shortage that makes a whole nother, a whole nother point, but we'll, we'll talk about it another time. So then the optimist can do various jobs as needed like humans, but it would be trained. It would have a huge amount of training so that it can once it's trained, it can jump from this job to that job. It can do, maybe it'll end up being able to do every job in some specific uh, company. It'll be able to do all of the jobs uh, in the factory, if you will, or in the distribution, in the shipping and receiving area, whatever. Um, and they can do 24 seven, of course. Now, Optimus is likely to cost way less than $100,000 a year. That's just a guess. I think uh, in the early days, if Tesla chose to, they could charge $100,000 a year and people would pay it. Um, but the reality is I think it'll be a lot less than that. So let's say it's $20,000 a year. Now you've reduced that $25 to $5 an hour. Um, that's $5 an hour, assuming the robot doesn't do it faster than the human. So I'm thinking that probably what we're talking about is you might have a, a situation where the bot is costing you between two and five dollars an hour to do a task. Well, that could be the entire way that you bring a product to market that could not be brought to market before. And we're not talking about one or two products. We're talking about hundreds or even thousands of small, medium-sized, even large, expensive products that could be brought to market or that, could be, that, or that would increase the TAM dramatically, the total addressable market. So like we're talking about cars right now, let's say that a... Um, uh, a Tesla automobile right now, let's call it the Model 3, is uh, $42,000. But let's say by using the Optimus bot, you're able to reduce the cost by $3,000. I would roughly say that means you're going to you're going to reduce the retail retail by $4,500 to $5,000. And so all of a sudden, you've got a car that costs 
that used to cost 42,000 that now goes out the door at 37, 37, five. Well, that's going to increase the number of people that can afford it. You see it? So that means that you're going to be, you're going to have more customers for that car. That means you're going to make more of them. This is kind of what I'm talking about throughout all of everything. And this is why every time we've been in a situation like this in history, whether we're talking about the farmers that were the number one job in America in the late 18th, uh, 19th century. Uh, yes, the late 19th century. Um, uh, you know, and then now today it's like less than 5% of the population in the United States. Uh, I don't care whether it's about secretaries talking about, uh, uh, uh clerks talking about tellers. You can just go down the list of all of the number one jobs, uh, previously that are now eliminated or almost eliminated. This will be the same thing will be true with lots of other jobs that are eliminated. Better jobs will be there because better products higher value products, higher value input from humans will be necessary in order to get us into these better uh, and, and basically increasing wealth. Oh yes, and then in my interviews with these experts, we've come to realize that the Optimus will only cost less than 6,000, probably around $5,000, maybe even less than that. But let's say in early days, as they're ramping up to the first million in 2024, it'll probably only be about, uh, uh, six to five thousand dollars each to make them and maybe if they make 10 million the next year the cost will come down even more so as you can see they could sell these for fifteen thousand twenty thousand all day long at a fantastic profit for a manufacturer but why would they in the early days they can charge a lot more or just lease them for twenty thousand dollars a year easily uh, I can't imagine anybody I can't imagine any factory not having a need for one or dozens hundreds of these as soon as they're available. So now <laughs> maybe you're starting to see where e Elon believes that this is the biggest business he's ever done because he also believes that there's a market for 8 billion of these. Ultimately, he believes that there will be 8 billion of these because people like you and me will have one in our home, ultimately. So each of us might have one bot. I, I've said before many times, I would have a bot just to give me great back rubs. You know, you have all these different machines you can buy that uh, massage your feet or, you know, put them on your chair and they kind of sort of try to massage your back and stuff. But an Optimus bot, if he was standing over your sh my shoulders right now, I'd be able to say, no, a little lower. No, no, could you, a little more firm uh, to the right, just a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a completely different kind of massage machine. And that alone could be worth 10, 10 or $20,000 to an awful lot of people. I think I'd pay the price. All right, let's talk about the quantities first. So if there's one bot for every human, that would be 8 billion bots. You might conjecture that they would have a useful lifetime of eight years. Now, when I say that, it, they may not wear out in eight years, or you may be able to, you know, constantly uh, get them uh, main, maintained and improved over those eight years. But I'm suggesting that maybe there'll be like uh, any other uh, electronic product that you buy eight years from now, there will be a better one and you'll want to upgrade. So let's, let's just say every eight years. So that would mean that you would need to build 1 billion a year if Elon's right about uh, 8 billion uh, 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 total being needed on the planet. Now, if you sold those for $20,000 uh, 20, each, that would be $20 trillion in sales per year. Now, <laughs> currently, Walmart has the most revenues of any existing company at about $573 billion. We're talking about $20 trillion, okay? Now, <laughs> so if you want to get more reasonable, and lower that expectation and say that Tesla might only make as many of those as the current auto business. So only 180 to 100 million of those a year, they sell them for $20,000 or so each. Well, now you'd only have revenues of somewhere in the neighborhood of $2 trillion compared to Walmart's measly 573 billion, almost four times as much. Now you potentially, hopefully you're getting it. So where are we in this process? Well, Tesla's had a few reveals over the past year. The most recent one shows that the product looked pretty much ready to go to work. I'm saying as a, an ex-manufacturer, I would have bought one for 20 grand. I would have paid $20,000 a year to lease one right as, as that robot was standing and doing certain small tasks even then. I would have understood that it would come with improvements and that I might have to train it. 
Um, but we also brought those experts on. They looked at these bots. They looked at the videos. They looked at, and by the way, these videos are up. You can see them on my YouTube channel. You can go back. In fact, some of them will also be on my new um, uh, podcast channel. Um, but you can't, won't be able to see some of the great videos on, on those podcasts. But you can go back and look at those in either place. And um, uh, the uh, experts said, no, that those bots are pretty much ready to go to work. <laughs> they might be a little slow right now. They might be a little unsure of themselves, but they will get faster and they will get more sure of themselves. Um, there might need to be some cosmetic improvements, some things that would would allow them to be cobots. I didn't know what a cobot was, but a cobot is a robot that works around humans or other robots and needs to be able to work in an environment and understand it's the environment around it. So there might be some things that need to be added in terms of uh, uh, protecting, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting your finger pinched or something like that. Um, but the, the the bot they they said the bot looks like virtually ready to go. So then we started looking at limiting factors. I said, okay, you think they're ready to go, but what is potential limiting factors, and can we eliminate those one at a time? So we started with raw materials. Were there any raw material issues? I mean, we have batteries and we have motors and we have plastic and we have some uh, hinges and other kinds of things. Do any of those things have any raw material issues that we can think of? And everybody that was asked said, nope, there was no raw materials uh, shortages that would interfere with getting right into business. Number two, were there any parts like those motors or joints that were hard to make in quantity that could be ramped up within months, not years, but in months, you could be making, you know, a million of those motors a year or 2 million or 3 million of those motors a year Are any of those parts. Was there any of those parts that would be difficult to ramp up to very large quantities? Every single expert said, no, there wasn't anything at all. So then we said, well, what about assembly? Is this going to be something that's going to take hours and hours, days and days to assemble every single robot? Of course, you might be able to use the robots to assemble the robots, and I'm sure that'll be a, the case at some point. But one of our experts estimated, and he was a 40-year guy that's been in this business. Who else? Uh, it's uh, uh, Scott uh, Scott Walter, uh, who's been out there doing this stuff for 40 years, uh, working with companies that are putting in robotics. He says he thought that the entire robot could be actually built in one half shift by one person on a couple of tables. So no, there was no issue with assembly. Uh, you wouldn't even need to really, in order in the early days, you could use humans or robots to assemble, uh, you know, op other optimists to assemble these quite easily without getting into any fancy equipment. Obviously, uh, I don't think you would ever need any massive, massive automation uh, to do these. Some people, some of the comments I've received, by the way, I love comments. I try to answer comments, send your comments. I will do my best to answer all of them. Some of the comments were, hey, send it to the customer in a box and uh, give them some assembly instructions and a YouTube video to help out. And, and some people said, hey, if you could get the robot, um, you would only have to assemble, you know, like the head and the shoulders and arms and hands, and then the robot could put, put the rest of the bot together himself. Anyway, all kinds of fun stuff in the comments. So no, no limitations at all with regard to assembly. So basically all the hardware and all the software all of that, there's no limitations in terms of getting all of that uh, put into the machine, ready to go. Cameras, just all of it is super easy. All right. So what about the limitations on the usefulness once you've got this thing built and ready to go? Well, we started to look at uh, the uh, limitations and they couldn't think of any limitations except two. And again, I would say at this point, we have five different experts from various different fields, all saying the exact same thing, balance and hands. So the video that we saw uh, 45 days ago, the bot was able to balance itself. It was able to walk around. It was able to uh, move objects from place to place. Um, it was able, so it was able to hold, hold objects would, which would tend to throw it off balance. It was able to recover, uh, you know, like a human would uh, after picking up the object, it didn't change its, it, issue of being able to balance itself. And then it moved uh, to another location and then it was able to use tools. And as one of the guys pointed out, um, when you put some tools like a like a drill motor have torque. And so when the torque starts, the you know, it would tend to move the arm of you or the robot. 
And uh, so you need the, the robot needs to know how to adjust to that torque. And then it, there would also potentially in some products, it would throw, uh, throw the person off balance. Anyway, what would be the issue with balance? And so again, everybody agreed the, this was not going to be hard. Lots and lots of humanoid balance, uh, humanoid robots currently balance themselves just fine. Uh, this is there's plenty of uh, information out there for Tesla to draw on. Again, their bot was already balancing itself. Um, the rest of it would be training, and we'll talk about the training in just a second with regard to the hands. Um, so balance doesn't seem to be an issue. Nobody thought balance was an issue. So the bigger issue is going to be the hands. So the hands, it's obvious from everything we know about Tesla and everything they've said so far is they want to make, they want to build one bot. Uh, they don't want to build this version, that version, you know, one for uh, for uh, shoveling uh, minerals out of uh, uh, lithium uh, locations and another one for drilling things into walls. Um, no, they want one bot that can do it all. And so they've designed the hands around being as as flexible and nimble and and having as many use cases as possible. And those things might iterate over the next six or eight months before they go into full production. By the way, that's my statement. Nobody has said they're going into full production yet. It's Randy guessing full production in 2024. So, um, but in the next six, seven, eight months, they're gonna be uh, attempting to get these hands to do hundreds, I'm gonna claim, tens of thousands of tasks before the end of 2023. We'll get into that just in a second. So the hands are designed to be very, very flexible and to be, it'll be software that helps the robot to balance in lots of different situations. It'll be software that helps the hands to be able to do lots and lots of useful tasks. So um, after multiple conversations with these same experts and watching other videos and trying to get as much information as I possibly can. This is the Randy method that I think op, that uh, Tesla will be using to train their Optimus robots. By the way, it's, uh, the plural is Optimi. We've decided it's Optimi is the plural. All right, this is just Randy. I, there, nobody else has said this. Tesla has not said this. I have no idea whether I'm right or not, but tell me in the comments, do you think this is probably what's gonna take place? All right, Optimus bots, are currently being trained, in my opinion, through imitation, verbal training, uploading specific training through coding, general information about the world, and training through simulations. Okay, so let's take a look. Let's break it down. First of all, you have imitation. So you have a human actor who goes into a workstation. He does the work while the robot watches with his camera eyes, and then the robot attempts to imitate that same action then the robot might fail and the, the trainer will then use, un, you know, do it again. And, and the, now the robot tries again, he tries to get more information, more information. And this could just be repeated and repeated and repeated, uh, very similar to what they're doing with full self-driving. All right, so that's number one way. Uh, you just do it over and over and over again with a human trainer. Now the human trainer could also be hooked up to wires and just like they do with, uh, animation and whatnot with they hook up the human to wires and then the animated character copies those those movements you can use the exactly the same technique with the bots and you can see videos online not mine but other people's uh videos online showing other robots that are being trained by hooking humans up to wires so that's one way number two would be verbal training um you would just like you do with a child or employee um i'm going to be meeting with dr know-it-all john gibbs later this week because I want to find out whether uh, we know that the bot can hear and we know that the bot could learn, uh, that it can understand words. The question I wonder is, can it also be in a conversation at this point? <laughs> so can you say to the bot, no, move it a little bit to the left. And the bot goes, are you sure you want me to do that? <laughs> so I'm going to find this out this weekend. So be sure to hit notify so that you can see the video where I talked to Chad about that one. So we know, about, at least we know that there could be verbal commands and the bot could follow the verbal commands. Now, so that'd be another way to train. Um, the other aspect of that could be written commands as well. So if you want to have somebody writing up commands and uploading those to all the bots all at once, there could be all kinds of lists 
of written commands that the bot should be able to understand based on where based on layers and layers and layers of understanding as it gets better and better all right so those are that's number two number three almost all current robots the big arm robots and all those kind of robots those robots are all trained by hard coding all of the boston dynamics robots they're coded they're coded hard coding by humans putting in the code all right so some of this could also be true for optimus some of those things that we want to be very very uh, well again maybe i'll ask john dr know it I'll, I'll ask him whether in some cases is it where you need specificity that maybe a human training wouldn't give us what are the kinds of circumstances but it would be possible let's just say for whatever the purposes might be you could be also hard coding optimus there's at least one robot in the world i'll i i'm not sure i can find the video anymore but there's at least one a robot out there that is currently being trained kind of the same way that chat gpt is being changed trained like on a large language model and in this particular case they're giving it lots of information about the the, the real world and about the environment that it might be working in so the, and it's and it's responding to that it is learning how to understand the real world by giving it lots and lots of information about the real world. So this is another way. This would be uh, number four uh, uh, method for training. And then five, the number five way, once a task has been learned, you might have a lot, a lot of, of variations, a lot of edge cases. And you may not want your human trainer to be sitting there showing it a million jillion edge cases. So these are things that could go up on a simulator and then you could have somebody uh, creating dozens, thousands, of variations to the training environment and then training the bot in in a uh, 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 virtual world, training the bot how to virtually make those uh, changes. Then you can download it back into the bots and then see if the bot is now able to do the job precisely in all kinds of circumstances. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is these are the five ways you would train. And so I believe Again, this is Randy only. Nobody else, well, other people believe that I'm right. Some of these experts believe that this is something like this is what's probably taking place. So I would have a thousand bots and 200 trainers, five bots per trainer. So I think one trainer could be moving bot to bot and working with at least five bots, maybe even 10. And you would have these uh, thousand bots and these 200 trainers you would probably have at least one shift, maybe two shifts, maybe even four shifts a week. If you wanted to speed up this process that I'm gonna talk about, you can maximize the shifts because the bots don't care. They will work 24 seven, just as well as they work for seven hours a day. They don't get tired, they don't need breaks, et cetera. So I'm thinking you go to, if you wanna get these bots trained as fast as possible, you go to four shifts and you have as many uh, uh, trainers on the floor, each shift as you need, in order to work with the bots, with a thousand bots. All right, so then um, what you have is you have, uh, we picture it, this is just in our mind, we picture this large room, <laughs> this large building. And in fact, they just uh, rented a brand new, very large facility, I think 150,000 square feet up north of Fremont. And we're thinking that might be the bot training center. In this room, you have all kinds of obstacle courses, whether it's the floor is on level or has things on it, whether it's things they need to move around, uh, and then tr training stations, how to hammer a nail, how to drill a drill, how to uh, put two things together, how to apply glue, all kinds of training stations around this room. And there's a bot at each of these training stations and multiple bots walking around in the environment. All of these bots are constantly, constantly learning um, and you have the trainers that are teaching them how to do these tasks. That's how we picture it. So if you did this, if you did a thousand bots, 200 trainers, and I don't know whether this is true or not, I'm just going to throw it out as a possibility that it takes 100 hours for each process to get it to actually be able to pick up any size nail, well, maybe one size nail, pick up one penny nail and use the right hammer to, to pound in that penny nail into a board might take 100 hours. I think it'd take less, but let's say 100 hours. Then if you wanna put it into a wall, maybe now it only takes another 10 hours to learn how to do it this way. If it needs to put it in directly in a line along a stud, 
Uh, maybe that takes another two hours to, to anyway, you get my drift. So I'm going to say that each task is 100 hours. You've got a thousand bots. Um, they're working 24 hours a day. And so you're talking about uh, 10,000 tasks in eight weeks or less. 10,000 tasks in eight weeks or less. Okay. So that's, that's my, that's my, my that's what I believe is going to happen. So you have these robots and they're learning 10,000 tasks each eight weeks. Now, is it just those 10,000 robots? I mean, those thousand robots? No, those thousand robots all now have 10,000 tasks in their training. And then every new robot you make already has those 10,000 tasks. And now next eight weeks, you've got another 10,000 tasks. And now you have 20,000 tasks, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want to do it faster than that, if you want to get it to 100,000 tasks, just build another thousand robots. The cost of building those robots and the cost of those employees is nothing compared to the opportunity advantage. Just the opportunity advantage in the in Tesla's own manufacturing facilities and the manufacturing facilities of their uh, 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 suppliers and the manufacturing facilities of their friends like SpaceX and uh, the rest of their friends. Um, and then, um, you know, moving it out into the real world. So sometimes, sometime this year, um, we will have um, robots that have 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 tasks uh, in their brain, ready to go. Um, and uh, then there will be time to decide to decide whether to go go live. Okay, so I believe that in the fourth quarter there will be another AI day, AI day three. And at AI Day 3, Tesla will introduce a ready-to-ship robot, a ready-to-ship Optimus. They will show it doing all kinds of different tasks. They will show it walking around in all kinds of environments where it doesn't need any help. It doesn't need anybody to take care of it or to babysit it. It'll be able to do the tasks. It'll be able to do it in its environment. It'll be ready to go. And they will put out an opportunity for people to buy it. And they'll tell you what it's going to cost per month or per year. Um, or whether you can buy the entire thing uh, straight straight away. Um, and then we'll see how many people line up to buy those. Uh, I think the line will be so much longer than it was for Cybertruck that the world will pay, that people will really take notice. I mean, every, I mean, it just, it's just, uh, if it can do what I just said, 20,000 tasks, and realize that, okay, next step. All right, so next step is you got to socialize it and train it in its environment. So I want to buy one. I have a bicycle water bottle manufacturing facility. I need this bot to put the caps on the water bottles. Okay. That's all I need it to do. And so I buy one. I pay my 20,000 or my 100,000, whatever it is, the bot comes in, but it hasn't been trained to put caps on water bottles. It's been trained on really normal kinds of things, screwing things in and nailing things in and who knows what, but it certainly has never been trained to put a cap on a water bottle. So now it, a, a representative of Tesla, a trainer, probably one of the ones who's been training those on the floor in North of Fremont there in that building. <laughs> one of those trainers goes with the bot and spends probably a day or a day and a half at the factory or at the distribution center or at the retailer, wherever it is that it's going. It goes with, uh, uh, the, the bot goes with this trainer and the trainer helps to socialize the bot in its environment, socialize the people so that they can understand what they need to know about working with a robot like this, with how they're going to work with Optimus, what they can and can't do, what makes sense, what they, and then ha actually have them start working with the robot and teaching it how to do things, and then uh, spend that time really training them and training the robot for its specific tasking that that company has, uh, and hopefully for additional ability to, to teach new tasks downstream. So that takes a day and a half. That should be easy. Uh, now the robot is ready to go in its environment. And then that trainer becomes the customer service person for that particular robot in that particular facility. Now, maybe there's three or four or five robots in that facility. And so that uh, customer service person becomes the ongoing customer service person. The lovely part about that is unlike anything else that you go sell somebody and then you have to go and show them how to use it. Um, after you show them how to use it, uh, you will still have eyes uh, available in that situation. So you'll be able to see through the eyes of the robot and you can use cameras and stuff if you need in order to be able to see how the robot's acting outside of its own eyes. 
but the customer service person can see specifically what it's doing and if necessary, help the company to overcome whatever issues that they might run into. So here we are, that is the process. That's what we think we know. There's a, I'm sure there's other things that I've forgotten, but, but that's, that's the basic list. I'd love for you to comment. Tell me what I missed. Tell me what your questions are. Tell me why you think I'm a complete nutcase. Oh, I, I did say, right, they'll sell a million of these the first year. Yeah, I think I said that. Um, so um, uh, hit the like button if you like this content and please subscribe and hit notify if you wanna be reminded about the John Gibbs video this weekend. Um, I'm hoping it'll be on, on Sunday, that's, that's the goal. And uh, also join Patreon if you would like to help support me in producing more content like this. Hey, it's been great talking to you. Click the link below to get your paperback, Kindle or audiobook now.